and to um, and to just go through this essential thing. So I'm right clicking on this model, SAR agent base for PLE and models featured in class and participant resources. And now I'm going to any logic and I'm going to go find that file that I just downloaded. I can do file open here and I'm going to go to downloads or wherever it is on your computer and that downloads go. And I'm going to say open. Okay, and I'm opening up said model. And it's taking a good long time to open it, which is interesting. Okay. 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 So, um, it, did everyone, was everyone online able to open that? Was everyone in the classroom able to open it? Okay. Or anyone need help? Anyone at all? No? Okay. Uh, okay, does anyone need help online? Please alert the TAs uh, if you need help here. Okay, and TAs, be sure to closely monitor the chat, right? That'd be okay. So, so let's go look at this model though. Um, so when we opened it, we see uh, a lot of different stuff, and I, and I want to talk about some some elements of what we're seeing. So um, over here on the left, we're seeing information on the structure of this model, and. Uh, this information is arranged in a form that we're going to see uh, many times, uh, in, in fact, as a routine matter in this boot camp. Okay. Um, so uh, there's going to be a, a set of pieces of the model, which are shown here in red, which are going to describe the, the model theory. It's sort of characterization of the world. And then beneath it, in these X's, are a set of scenarios or experiments, hence the X, um, that are going to run this model with different particular assumptions. Now, that's a lot of a lot of tech, a lot of words there. Let, let's go in and, and go see what these look like. So I'd like you to double click on person. Okay. So if you double click on person. And please just raise your hand if you need help on uh, here in the classroom. Um, and uh, anyone online, please write in the chat. Okay. Okay. So if we open up person, we'll see something like the following. And um, this is depicting a theory of a person. And in, in this case, it's a particularly simplistic theory. And I, I actually alternated when planning this first session uh, about whether to feature an incredibly simple model, descriptively simple model like this, or whether to feature something that was more rich and more complex and more textured and more recognizable as, as perhaps a, a more plausible theory. But in this case, I stuck with it because I, I wanna make some points with the simplest possible model. So in this case, we're depicting a theory of personhood that is stark and it's uh, austere in its rendition. People can be in a susceptible state, colored here in yellow, an infectious state in orange red, or a recovered state in, in gray here, okay? They can be one of those three possible states. At any time, they're in exactly one of them. So each person you could think of in the model as evolving over time, and at a given time, they're in exactly one of these states. So they're either susceptible or they're infectious or they're recovered. And they move between those states. There's an action that changes that state that moves them from susceptible to infectious, called infection. Or there's an action that moves them from infectious to recovered, called recovery. And there's some way in which they can go and and be made 
the equivalent of recovered have immunity um uh in in some way we'll we'll come back to later um it'll be through receiving a, a vaccination that can be made as if they are recovered now a person at a given time is in one of these states and they change over time between these states according to these transitions so only if they're susceptible can they get infected that's why this this transition goes from susceptible to infectious. Do you see that? Okay. Um, so these people, though, are placed within a broader context. Um, they're going to be placed within the context of an environment with people around them. And I won't show you all the details of it. But they're placed, in this case, in this square grid. Each person will look like one of these small squares here. And um, we're going to see, over time, um, that small square change in color, reflecting a person's infection status. So if they're susceptible, that small square will be, will be yellow. It'll be red if they're infectious and gray if they're, if they're recovered. But these people are not solitudes. They're placed in this grid. They're placed in the context of other people, north, south, east, west, so to speak of them. Um, and they interact with those people. And the, and the way in which they interact is if they're in this susceptible state, notice I'm again in person here, if they're in this susceptible state, they can... I'm oh, sorry, if they're in the infectious state, they can spread the infection. If they are infectious, they can contact a neighbor, or in this case, a random neighbor nearby them, and spread the infection or, or expose that person to, infect, uh, to infection. Now, that person who they exposed might be susceptible, in which case that neighbor could themselves get infected, or that person to whom they expose, um, uh, who they expose, uh, could be already recovered, in which case, or infected, in which case it won't matter that they're further exposed to this infection. So they're exposing people to this infection over time, okay, to this, to this pathogen. And each of these people is placed within this, uh, within this state. Now, above that, we're going to have a plot which shows the number of people who are susceptible or who are infectious and who are recovered over time. Okay, so what we've just seen here is a particularly austere, particularly simple, stylized theory of personhood. I mean, it's it's uh, uh, about as uh, about as believe uh, as basic as one could get in terms of its depiction, right? Person susceptible, infected, recovered, and they can go from susceptible to infectious and infectious to recovered, and they can infect other people while infectious. This is very descriptively simple, very, very stylized, very minimalist in its interpretation. And you might think from a model that simple, you know, surely nothing that interesting could come about. But we're going to see that's actually not quite true. A model of this sort can be very simple in terms of its description, but can yield complex behavior. When I'm saying complex here, I mean complex in a technical sense, that, that it can yield behavior that you just wouldn't anticipate given this depiction itself, given the pieces, the description of each piece, in this case, each person, we wouldn't expect this sort of um, behavior that we'll end up seeing. So I will tell you that this is a theory. It's a particularly simple theory of personhood uh, involving people and their interactions and space and the, and the, the situations they can be in, the states they can be in. But it's a model. It's, it's a model that we can use to show to someone else and they could critique it, right? The fact that we have this Let's us show it to someone and they might object, right? They might say, well, wait a minute, you're forgetting there's a latent state of infection where they're infected, but not yet infect shots, right? Having a model is, is beautiful. It takes our theory 
puts it out in the clear light of day where someone could look at it and critique it. Or they might say, well, wait a minute, there's, there's, in, there's uh, symptomatic infectious people and asymptomatic infectious people. And symptomatic infectious people are, are found in, and treated sooner, so they recover sooner. Think of an STI type situation, sexually transmitted infections. Whereas asymptomatic people, maybe with gonorrhea, might go for much longer without being detected. And so maybe you need those. Having a model is useful. Having a model just by itself shares our understanding of the world in a way that opens it up to critique, opens it up to being challenged, and opens it up to discussion. So having a model like this as a starting point has some value to it. But the real value of the tools we'll be talking about in this boot camp is that they, they take a model like this and they make it precise enough that it can be enacted. What do I mean by that? I mean, it can be put into action. I mean, it can be run over time. We could see the logical consequence of this over time. And as we'll see here, over space. So let's, let's go do that. So I'm going to go over here to the... Um, to the to the model structure, and I'm going to go to the to this scenario, this experiment called baseline. Do you see that there? Do people see it? Okay, I need the TSV monitor in the chat because it's it's hard for me to to monitor while I'm doing this. Um, okay, um, so I'd like you to right click on baseline and say run. See that? See where you could say run? Okay. Um, so I right clicked on this and I said run. And there we go. Um, so I'm going to, there's a button that says run the model and switch to main view and I'm going to press that, okay? And I'm going to teach you a little bit about this interface while we're doing this, just so you can use it skillfully. I'm going to press this. Um, I'm going to press this button and watch it go. And when I do that, you'll notice this interface here is telling me that the model is running here. Okay, um, and uh, it's taking a, a moment to run on mine, but you can see it starting to spread. I'm going to press this button here, which is a pause button, okay? And sometimes it takes a minute for it to pause, but it's actually paused now. Now, what, what happened here is we started it with a single person infected. And we're gonna come back to what's going on here, but I first wanna orient you with these buttons down here, okay? So down here, we have a button that will start it running again, a button that will stop it. And then we have some controls that will let us speed it up. This one will speed it up, go from one time, you know, so one times normal speed to two times normal speed to five to 10. I'm gonna go set it back to one with this button here. And we're also gonna have, there's a button that will have it run as quickly as possible. I would suggest not doing that right now because we're interested in how it's playing out here, okay? Who needs help here? Who ne who's having trouble seeing what's on the screen? Who would like some help? Anyone want some help here? Anyone online want some help? Okay, so, so we started it running and it started to spread. It started with a single person here uh, and started to spread. And I'm going to continue to, I'm gonna press this button and continue watching it. So can anyone say what's going on here? What's happening here? Anyone? Okay, so I'm going to, Pause this here. So it's a great question. Um, or it's a great, a great, great statement. Okay, is the population size increasing? Well, maybe, maybe we'll get some insights by looking up. Remember, with this model, you can go and uh, there's actually, if you click 
and drag down, you can see up at the top of the screen, there's actually some further information. Do you see that? So if you click and drag down, TAs, make sure people are, are equipped to do this, they can click and drag down. Um, uh, so you'll notice that there's a display of the number of people who are infected here over time. Uh, it turns out the total of these is, is uh, just short of 50,000, okay? Um, but, uh, but you'll notice the, that here, as, as we watch this graph, something is happening. Can anyone say what's happening? Anyone online or anyone in person? What is this graph telling us? The red are the infectious people. The, the yellow, uh, should, or these ones are the susceptible, which are way up at the top. Um, we can't see them right now, but they're up there. And the recovered are are these guys, um, uh, these guys here, were shown kind of strangely in yellow. Um, okay, so what's happening here? Can anyone say? So what? over here, trying to have less infectious people, more recovered people, and less susceptible. Okay, so we have fewer susceptible, but the number of infectious people is actually rising right now. There's more red, right? Red is infectious, yellow here is, is susceptible, and gray is recovered. So can anyone describe what's, you know, at an intuitive level, what's happening here? Like, why are we seeing this? So we're seeing some weird, strange things. What what are we seeing and why are we seeing that? Anyone? So, so we have this theory, people are susceptible, that's the yellow, then they're, they, they can become infected. If they're exposed to someone who's infectious, they can become infected uh, and that's the red, and then they recover, that's the gray. Um, and each person who's, who's infectious, you know, exposing people next to them to infection. If those people are susceptible, they can get infected. Whoa, that's fun. Um, so, so what's what's happening here? Anyone? You mean the graph? Or yeah. Or so, what can anyone describe? Like we see a shape. Well, I'll be. Um, Sorry, I was trying to create a breakout room so TAs could help. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it's showing on your screen too. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, uh, so feel free to, to proceed. Um, so what? Why is it that we're seeing this kind of round shape? Why? Why are? Why is it we're seeing this bunch of red next to the yellow, and then we're seeing this gray in the middle? Can anyone describe what what's happening here? So we're enacting this theory in the model. We're enacting this theory we saw just a moment ago with this sort of thing and, and people, people spreading who are infectious spreading infection to people next to them. Why does it result in this pattern? Why is it growing over time? Yes. And your name? It's uh, Sal. Sal. Okay. Yes. So it grows over time because you have more people who are infected at one point then the, there's a group of susceptible people who would be infected at that time, but as the time progressed, okay. now you have more people who are recovering and less people who are susceptible. That so, is true. Yeah, Good. so that proportion that are infectious being confined inside a uh, population which is no longer susceptible. So that's why it's not progressing. Anymore. Okay, okay, so these folks, it's not progressing in, in this area, this internal one. There is some movement going on in this outer part, right? It's it's if we run it here, and you could see it's kind of spreading. Why is it spreading outwards? Can anyone say? Why is this spreading out here at the edge? What's happening? Only the people who are susceptible can become infected. Only the yeah, exactly. It's uh, right along. So Wanda, exactly, just like Sab had had mentioned, you have. Once someone's recovered, they can't get infected. So not much is happening here, except some of these infectious people are recovering. It's really the, the big actions taking place in this edge 
where you have susceptible people next to infectious people, right? And if we go and we look upwards, we will we will see that the number of infectious people has been rising, but it's not rising that quickly anymore. In fact, it seems to kind of plateau. The number of susceptibles has come down quite a lot because more and more of them have been exposed to infection. And the number of recovered people is, has been going up. So we see this, this kind of uh, ring of infection spreading outwards and the set of, of recovered people here in the center. So um, let me ask, where, so is this ring and the fact that infectives are concentrated on the outside of it and are right next to the susceptibles, and is that somewhere in this model? Is there anywhere in this model it says something about a ring and the ring is expanding outwards? The answer is no, there's nothing in the model that directly says, let there be a ring of a certain size and let it move outwards and let the infectious people be on the outside of this ring and most of the people internally are recovered and all the susceptibles are, are, are out here outside of the infectives. There's nothing in there that says that. This is rather what we call an emergent behavior of this model. This theory gives rise to behavior of this sort. It generates behavior of this sort. Nowhere in the model does it say this is what will happen directly. Rather, it's the logical implication of all these pieces of the model acting together. The fact that Infectives expose people next to themselves, but only and only susceptibles can get infected and people recover after a certain time of being infectious. Those things all collectively lead to this phenomena where we have this ring of infections spreading outwards. Um, now, uh, what we're seeing here is a property that results from this model, a behavior over space, that's what we're seeing here, and over, if we scroll up, over time here um, as well, uh, shown in this graph, which is shows emergent properties. It comes from this, but it can't be reduced to any one piece of this. It can't be reduced to a person. In a way, it's kind of like um, the notion of a traffic jam. A traffic jam is composed of vehicles on the road, but it's something more than the vehicles, right? Like you can know all the world about engines and wheels of cars and the the you know carrying capacity of different types of trucks and and uh, the number of cylinders they have and so on. But you'll know almost nothing about traffic jams. Traffic jam is a higher level concept. It's, it's not just reducible to the pieces. It's something that results beyond the pieces out of which it's composed. And there's many concepts like that. There's many phenomena like that in the world. We're constantly surrounded by these phenomena in the world that are not reducible to the pieces. They transcend the pieces. There's something more than that. If we want to understand why traffic jams form, we could spend all the world researching cylinders and cars and axle sizes and tire types, and we won't get any further in understanding the traffic. If we want to understand the spread of infection, it's not that we don't derive any benefit from knowing about, you know, uh, the exact timing of people's recovery and, and you know, um, the likelihood they'll get infected if exposed. Those things will tell us some, but we need something more than knowing about those pieces to, to understand the behaviors we observe like this, how infections spread in the population.
But let's take this further, if we could. Let's uh, let's take this further. So I'd like to stop this model. We've seen emergent behavior now. And now I'd like to, ladies and gentlemen, go to one of the more useful things we can do with the model that we can't do in the world. So models are tools for thinking. They're thinking prostheses. They help us think through these sort of implications of our theory over time, over space. They help us take a theory, articulate it, show it to other people, get their critiques, get challenged about it, put it in the clear light of day out of our heads. But then they let us enact that theory in ways that see its logical consequences over time and uh, let us compare that with what we see in the world. But they're more than that. They let us ask what would happen what, what's the logical implication for variance in the theory, for, for different uh, particular assumptions? So we've just been running what's called the baseline scenario, which is uh, kind of the default scenario, the status quo. Sometimes it's the business as usual. It's the scenario that kind of depicts our best understanding of, say, the current situation. Let's go to a situation where instead of um, so in that baseline, I should say, if you go to that baseline scenario, go over to the properties window and let a TI know if you can't see the properties window, ladies and gentlemen, let them know. When you go down to parameters, you'll notice that there's uh, a set of parameters, a set of particular assumptions behind this model. There are assumptions about average illness duration or contact rate, infection probability, et cetera. I'd like you to focus on average illness duration. What does it say is the average illness duration for the baseline? Anyone? 10 days. 10 days. 10 days. Yeah, 10 days. Let's go to slow recovery. Suppose people stay infectious for long. I suppose they stay infectious for longer. Where would, how would that affect things here? People stay infectious for longer. What, what is that going to mean? That means they're going to do what? They're going to stay here in this infectious state for longer, and they're going to infect more people potentially, right? They, they mean, since they're staying infectious longer, they'll have more chance to expose people around them to infection, which could lead them to infect more people, right? Mm. Um, let's suppose we wanted to, to run a scenario like that, where instead of being infectious for 10 days, they're infectious here for 50 days, five, zero days. Let's go run that. I'm gonna right click on it and I'm gonna say run. We're going to enact the model with that assumption, that alternative assumption. Models are thinking tools. It's not that they're a crystal ball that tells us about the future. No, 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 no. They're tools for thinking through the consequences of our assumptions here, ladies and gentlemen. They help us test the consequences of our assumptions against their logic. We see their logical implications by running the model. And then we can compare that against data from the world and, and, and test it against uh, our observations from the world, amongst other things. But we can ask what if questions. So I'm going to say run the model. What do you think is going to happen, though? Before this runs, what do you think is going to happen? They may infect more people. Do you think, uh, how would that visually affect what we see? What do you think is going to be the difference from before? I'm going to, oh, well, I should have asked quicker. What, what's going to be the difference from what we see before? Why are we seeing this? What's different? Can anyone say what's different from before? Recovery takes longer. Recovery takes longer. And so what is the visual impact of that here? What are we seeing different visually? Because recovery takes longer, people are, more people in the center remain what? Infectious, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, 
So we have a much larger number of people here who are infectious. And there's a thicker band around this outer area. Why is this mostly red here? Why is this is red and, and gray? I'm trying to get you to think mechanistically. Why are we seeing these results? What By what process? Um, what is the, the driver for why we're seeing lots of gray in here mixed with uh, some red, but lots and lots of red here and just a bit of gray? Why is it that this is mostly red? because they are they say that again uh, people need long time yeah people need a long time to recover most of these folks many of more of these folks have recovered whereas here they just recently got infected and so not many of them are recovered yet right they're in fact they remain on average I should have emphasized this on average, they remain infectious for 50 days. So a lot fewer of these have recovered yet. And we can continue to, to, to run this, but let's, let's go up to the graph at the top and see what happened here. Uh, so I'm going to, okay, it's being kind of on the slow side, scrolling up here. Okay. Um, run, run max on speed. So that oh, oh gosh. I don't know how I switched over to that. That was, yeah. I, I unless unless that's the default for for that scenario. But I was pretty sure that I had switched it to. Uh, oh, it is virtual time. Okay, I'm gonna change it to real time. I had actually uploaded it a new version, but I think it's a link to the old version. Okay, um, I switched it. Sorry, folks. I just to make this easier to see for slow recovery, I went down to model time and switched it to be real time with scale one. Okay, and I'm doing the same for fast recovery. For fast recovery, I'm going to go and go down to model time. This may be collapsed initially. Model time and real time with scale one. Okay, that will just make it easier to observe. Um, sorry, I was certain that I had uploaded that diversion. Okay, so slow recovery. We do see um, an implication that people stay infectious for longer. Um, and we had the idea that maybe they infect. That there's also more people around the periphery who, who you know remain remain um, uh, remain uh, infectious. But in terms of infecting more people, it, it was a very good idea um, that we explored. But uh, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, immediately obvious in the in the graph here. It it maybe goes up a little bit quicker, yeah. Um, maybe it's a bit steeper and uh, and spreads uh, a little bit more into the population. But in both cases, we get uh, eventually essentially all of the population. Um, infectious. So this this uh, infected about 20,000 people at its peak. Do you see that? The number of infectious went up to about 20,000. Do you see that? For the baseline, let's go rerun that. Baseline, let's go rerun it and see what was the peak number, right? What was the number that it went up to when we infect, when we recovered after only 10 days? 10 days of, of uh, infection. Let's let's go see this. Okay. So I'm going to speed that up a bit. And we'll go up here. And we're enacting this model with different particular assumptions. So we enacted it with 10, um, 10 days on average until recovery. And and 
just a minute ago, we did so with 50. With 10, we see it goes up more slowly. Um, people are not getting uh, the rise of infection isn't nearly as steep, and it only goes up to 5,000, right? Instead of 20,000. So quite a difference in its peak value. Now, in both cases, the number of recovered individuals goes to about all of the population, 50,000. So people are getting infected, um, just it takes longer with the baseline. With the slow recovery, people are getting in fact infected faster. The total number of people to get infected in both cases is essentially the whole population. But the peak is much steeper for the slow recovery because they can infect more people sooner. You know, people are getting infected sooner. How about fast recovery? Let's suppose we made fast recovery. Um, and we if we go look at fast recovery and we look at the parameters, we see average illness duration two days. Anyone want to hazard a guess? What would what would it mean if, if people could recover in two days? What do you think the implications are uh, for the results? How about the, the total number of people that will get infected or um, the cumulative number that ever get infected? Um, how do you think that will change things if people can recover in two days on average, not 10? Quarter of the minute, you know, mm -hmm. context of the limited, they will recover fast. They'll recover fast. And do you think it will make a big difference in the, in the uh peak size, the number of people that are infected at the peak, do you think it'll be um, similar or will it be a lot lower than for the baseline? It's kind of hard to think it through, right? It's it's a little bit hard because people are still connecting the neighbors. Yes, wait. So online, Zachary says there will be a way smaller peak for the yeah, infection person. So great. Uh, so uh, it, it, it sounds reasonable. Let's go test it out, right? Computers are very good at doing lots of dumb things quickly. They can, they can very quickly simulate things that in our head, it's, it's hard to really think fully through they can tell us the logical consequences of our assumption. So I'm running this. And what we're seeing actually looks, does it look the same or different from what we saw before? Anyone? Does that look the same as what we saw before with the baseline? More susceptible people in the center. Yeah, there's a bunch of susceptibles left over here, right? The, these these folks here, wh why would they be left over? Why why aren't they getting infected now? They were exposed to someone who was infected. Yeah, they they never got exposed to someone. People are recovering so quickly, they're not exposing all their neighbors, right? This is what Saab was uh, and talking about earlier. You know that that um, if people recover really quickly they may not expose enough of their neighbors to infect them. And you're gonna have a lot of leftovers here. You still see a kind of ring of sorts, but it's kind of real twisty-like, isn't it? Would you agree it's real twisty-like? <laughs> okay, hearing no objections, um, I'm, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. What do you think that curve is above for the number of people infectious over time. What do you think that looks like? So here we go. By the way, why aren't these folks in the center getting infected now? Like what, why aren't they getting, getting all sick right now? Why are these folks still left over and, and they're not getting sick? Anyone? The thinking mechanistically, why aren't they getting sick? Because no one around them is infectious, right? Again, I'm trying to exercise here mechanistic thinking about like, why do we see these results? We're seeing these results for, for particular reasons. The mechanisms 
here, for these folks to get infected, the mechanisms require someone to be next to them who's infectious. Otherwise, this susceptible will never get infected. Okay, so let's go and let's look what went on up, 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 up above. Zachary hit it not right on the head and saw that, you know, there'd be a way smaller peak of infectious. And here, is everyone infected at the end? No, 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 they're not. There's actually lots of left of folks who weren't infectious before, you know, when the fire burnt through, the fire of infection, there was a lot of wood that never burnt fully, fully through, right? And it's it's left over here. Um, so that's an implication of this alternative assumption. We're running this model with alternative you know, details about the assumptions. And we see it can actually have rather different consequences. So this looks very different than the baseline where everyone got infected eventually. And it looks very different from slow recovery where everyone got infected pretty quick you know, went way high. Here, not only is the, the peak number infected much smaller, but more than that, there are lots of left folks who never get infected at all, ever, right? Okay, so models help us think through quickly the implications of these assumptions. There are logical consequences. This, I would argue, is a logical consequence. This is an emergent behavior of the model. Nowhere in the model does it say if this parameter is in this range, you know, there are leftover people. No, no, no. This is this is generated by the model. It's a logical consequence of this rather simple structure, the set of simple assumptions and the particular values of the parameters here, like about their time of recovery, the average illness duration, which is what we're specifying here is two, it gives rise to this behavior. This cannot be reduced to any one person. It can't be reduced to any one piece of this. Is it the result of this infection transition? Yeah. It's, is it the result of spread of infection? Absolutely. Is it the result of this recovery? Absolutely. Is it the result of people having an infectious state instead of a, a latent state of infectious? Yes. It, it results from all of those, but it can't be reduced to any one. Any more than a traffic jam can be reduced to the wheels, the axle sizes, the, the engine, right? It's something more than that. There's all this phenomena in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that you could study the pieces all you want and all the detail but you're going to be missing the point of why you see certain phenomena unless you can also put that together in an integrative way to understand emergent behavior, this, this generative behavior, the fact that the system gives rise to behavior. But I have one final exercise for you with the model, and then we'll break. We'll break for a health break. Um, okay, so... What I'd like to do is to add in to this model. I'm, I'm going to show a principle here that structure drives behavior. This is a particularly prominent principle in the system dynamics community, but it, it really holds across all areas of dynamic modeling. Structure drives behavior. The fact that we have this structure People were susceptible, um, could go on to become infectious, people infectious could recover, drove a lot of the, the behavior. You sometimes hear said about modeling, garbage in, garbage out. A model is just uh, is just the result of, uh, of the data that goes into it. People who, who state those things couldn't be more wrong about about this idea that a model is just the data. Because much more fundamental than the data is the structure. You could have all sorts of different data for a certain structure, and you'll get certain regularities that are invariable because of the structure. A lot of the expertise that goes into these models is not the data, although that is valuable, it's important. We saw it matters if it's 
50 days to recovery, 10 or two. But it's about the structure that's captured in the model. And, and when I talk about structure, I mean, here we have, you know, three states and we have ability to go from one to the next and one to the next. And this recovery state takes place with a certain rate, what we call a hazard rate in biostatistics, a chance per unit time. And this infection takes place if you're exposed to pathogen and people in the infectious state impose people. That's structure. And if this instead had an exposed state and then an infectious state, a state of latent infection, we would see different behavior. And I want to challenge you. Let's suppose, ladies and gentlemen, let us now suppose that we have a waning time of we have waning of immunity. Okay. How would, if we had people here who could lose immunity, after a certain time, how would it affect it? Anyone? How would it? Okay, so so I, I heard uh, infected. You were saying sub as well. You can get reinfected. They can get reinfected. Yes, and they can get infected more than more than once. How would that? So thinking in terms of the mechanics of it, in terms of sort of what we would need to represent uh, here, what. If we want to re represent a hypothesis, a dynamic hypothesis in this model, we want to add to our theory this idea that people could lose immunity. What would we what would we need to put in here? Um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's a transition. Where would that transition come from and where would it go to? To represent the fact that immunity is not permanent. People can lose it and become susceptible again. Recovered to susceptible again. So we're saying in the recovered state, people are immune. Right? If, if they get a message of exposure, um, if they're susceptible, it won't affect them. If they're infectious, it, they'll ignore it. And if they're recovered, they'll ignore it right now. But we're going to add the ability for people who are recovered to go back to the susceptible state, to become susceptible again. Okay? That's what we're going to do now. So we're gonna change the structure of the model. And I claim to you, I held forth from this floor that the structure determines behavior. And we're gonna see, does it? How much does it determine behavior? How does it change the behavior? Let's go try this. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss the significance of this very moment. We're gonna be taking your first step into actually building them up modifying a model, modifying the assumptions, the fundamental assumptions of a model right now. So to do this, to equip you to do this, you should go to the palette. TAs, form a phalanx and prepare to deploy. <laughs> okay, so uh, so uh, please please rise and, and be prepared. So go to the palette. Okay, so if any of you don't see the palette, you should do view palette. Yes, so Zachary also got the arrow from recovered to susceptible. The arrow hit its target, exactly. So if you go to the palette, there should be uh, a, uh, a menu over here to the left, and there's a small red icon that looks like da Vinci's measure of man. It's called agent, and you can click on it, and we'll see that sub palette, the palette for agents. Okay, now from this palette, we're going to drag in a transition. So the way in which the palette works is you, you go and you click on this and you drag over to the canvas and uh, if you get skilled with any logic, you may want to stick it so it turns green here. I will just put it down here and we'll arrange it manually. The key thing is to make sure that where it comes from, it turns green. It has this green marker to sort of where it hits that. And then where it go to, goes to, it also turns green. Green is the color. State charts are the game. So 
Um, for those who didn't catch that, if you're behind, I will go do it again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just show you how to do it again. I, I clicked in the transition on the transition and palette. I dragged it over and I arranged it here so that it comes from here and it goes to here. Okay, now you may complain and rightfully so that this is aesthetically hideous. Um, and so I will double click here and I will drag out and I will de hideify it, okay? Or I will seek to. Um, and I will drag out like that. How did I do that? I double clicked and it will add this little handle and I can bend it in a way um, according to my desire. Also, any logic supports undo, so you can undo it easily if you, if you seek to. The key thing here is that this arrow, this transition, it, it needs to be docked with green on both sides. That indicates it's being registered as coming as, as really connecting to this and here. So the idea is that this is a, what should we call this transition? Maybe waning of immunity. So I'm clicking on this transition and its properties are shown over on the right-hand side. So I'm going to say waning of immunity. And I'm going to say show name as befits the dignity of our model. And, and I'm going to put it there. In general, it's good to give things names because if you want to show this model to someone, remember, one of the most important things, models are learning tools. And one of the most important ways you learn is by showing them to others and getting them to challenge and critique it and, and uh, comment on it. It can also bring out knowledge from them. And so right here, uh, we're naming this so that others might understand what we meant by it. So I said waning of immunity. By the way, if it's under if it's underlined like that, you can kind of uh, move it around. And this is going to be a timeout transition of ninety days, nine zero days. So ninety days after getting recovered, they will lose immunity and become susceptible. Okay, that is now part of our theory of the world as captured by this model. And we can see what are the logical consequences of this theory by running the model. We could say, how does that change the behavior? So I pose to you. Yes, uh, Sab. Uh, great, great. Um, TAs, uh, the, phalanx, the phalanx needs to deploy. Okay, if, if 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 we need strength and TA numbers, we're going to need to bring in the elephant troops too. So 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 let, let's get let let's get the TAs going, or else we're going to have real elephant king problems. Okay. Um. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we have ninety days to recover, excuse me, ninety days to lose immunity. Nine, and 90 days, people lose their immunity and become susceptible again. How do you think that would affect the behavior we saw? Let's say for the baseline, where we had 10 days till recovery. For that baseline, you may remember it. It spread. Eventually, everyone got infected, but the peak was kind of low of the numbers. Everyone got infected eventually, and the infection, so number of people infected went up and came down. How do you think losing immunity, if we assume after 90 days, people can lose immunity, how do you think that would affect things? Anyone? You mean the graph? Yeah, yeah. so let's suppose we were to ask uh, for that graph, how would it change things? Sure. So yeah, I mean like, it will come down to mm -hmm. a point and then it will reach peak, come down and it will start going to peak again. Aha, uh -huh. so it could go up again. And it can go up again because people are now becoming susceptible and can get infected. Okay. How about in terms of that 
Spatial spread. How do you think it will spread differently? Anyone? Will it look different? So it's a little bit hard to think this all through in our heads. This is what computers are good at, telling us the logical consequence. Look, it isn't that this is the model is, is necessarily the correct depiction of the world. It's models aren't the truth. They speed us towards the truth by helping us think through the consequences of our assumptions more rigorously, more deeply, more quickly, more thoroughly. This model may be not particularly accurate in its depiction of a situation, but it helps us think through how these things interact that sharpens our thinking. They sometimes help us realize that our cherished misconceptions of the situation just don't hold water. They just don't add up to be consistent with what we see from the world. If we were thinking totally in our heads about this, well, we see it, right? I'm asking you whatever, what, what exactly it's going to look like. It's going to be hard to think. We're not very good at thinking through the logical consequences of things in our heads. Models help us think through the logical consequences of our assumptions. And sometimes we find that things we thought are the case just don't seem to add up. It just doesn't jive with what we see from the world, uh, it, the logical consequences of our, of our best guess of the situation. So models are not the truth. They speed us towards the truth by allowing us to more quickly find faults in our reasoning, in our th where find identify where our thinking is off base. So I just added this. Let's go run it for the baseline. So we're going to run it for the baseline scenario. Here we go. Run. Right click on the baseline scenario and we say run. Okay. Um, and, and we're going to run to the mom, run the mom. Okay. So what are, what are we going to see in terms of its spread? Anyone? Um, it's, it's doing its thing. It's, it's uh, going to be seeding the first person and and let's go see what's what's happening. There it is. It started down here on the the lower right, and it's it's spreading outwards. Do you see any difference right now? Why not? Why don't we see any difference right now? Mechanistically, it hasn't. Yeah, it hasn't been ninety days yet. How could it's only been eighteen and you know nineteen days, twenty days? By the way, if you don't see that little panel, you can bring it up with this. Um, 23 days. The first time we'd expect to see any difference is what? How far in? 90 days, right? Because we said at day 90, you know, it's 90 days after they got infected, after they recovered, they can then, they can then um, uh, get infected again. They can become susceptible. Um, so after they recover, and that would probably, they only got to recovery like 10 days on average after they got infected. So so really it's around day 100, we'll start to see things. So it's spreading out. This is familiar to us, right? Who's this yellow person down here? Mr. Lucky, <laughs> yes, Ms. Lucky. So so they they avoided getting infected, right? They dodged about a hundred arrows um, lobbed at them by their neighbors, and they 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 uh, they somehow managed to stay uninfected. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, so it's spreading out sixty two. Again, emergent behavior. In our model, we don't describe there's this ring going outwards. We don't say make it gray in the middle and red out. It's all implied by it all is the logical consequence of our assumptions interacting. If it's emergent behavior implied by the model structure. And to capture that, we run the model. Models capture this emergent behavior. Okay, so. We're, we're running it and I'm speeding it up a little bit. Um, okay, 85, they, okay, now, what are we gonna see? Ooh, what's happening there? What do you think's happening? Anyone? 
Now people are becoming susceptible. Now people are becoming susceptible again. What do you think the result of this is going to be? With people becoming susceptible. Okay, so do you is there gonna be another wave, you think? Yes. Aha, the wave has started. Where is that wave started? Why do I say the wave has started? It's starting in here, right? Who are these yellow? Why are why is all this turning yellow? Because what is happening? Now yeah, people who had recovered are now becoming susceptible. And this is the second wave, right? That it, it had to hit, these new susceptibles had to hit someone who is still what? Infected for it to form another wave, right? Okay, so this is now the second wave of infection. Hmm? And we we see that as a consequence of this assumption, right? Suppose we had said it's not a hundred, it's not ninety days until they lose immunity. It was two hundred days. Do you think there would have been a second wave? There still be a second. Okay, let's let's try it, right? Uh, let's try it. Let's. Uh, it's a great it's a great conjecture, and let's give it a chance. Uh, so. Uh, so we're doing this. By the way, uh, before we finish this one, do you think there'll be a third wave eventually? Yeah. yeah. And so, in fact, uh, now we're at time about 200. And so we're kind of should be expecting pretty soon some of these recovered individuals starting uh, once again to become susceptible, right? Um, there's They're going to... Uh, here they go. Here they go in the central area, right? Um, and that may allow, lay the groundwork for for this uh, third wave, right? Um, you could see them. You could see them spreading there. And there you go. And here you can kind of see a uh, a number of uh, infectious individuals uh, going through. Kind of it went up, it went down, and then it went up, and now it's going down again. And we're going to sit soon see a, a third wave as uh, as more people become infectious. Okay, so let's 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 go try that. Um, uh, so so I'm going to change this temporarily. I'm going to teach you a skill. I'm going to teach you a. I'm going to I'm going to learn you a skill here, folks. Um, okay, so so we're gonna go to Maine. We're gonna go down Maine, and we're actually gonna scroll over to the left. Okay, you can see there's some things here called average illness duration, contact rate, infection probability. So how did I get here? I went to Maine and I scrolled to the left. Do you see that? Could be a second wave. Okay, good, good. Okay. Okay, um, so ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to go and I want to drag a parameter in called um, duration. Uh, so what did I do? I From this agent palette, I dragged in this thing called parameter. How did I do that? I went and I, just like before, I dragged in this transition, I'm, I have main up and I drag in parameter from up here. And I'm gonna call this parameter duration. So duration, well, I'll call it immunity duration just to be similar to the one above, immunity duration. And immunity duration will be by default 90 days but we're gonna be, we're gonna create a sub scenario, a, a, a sub scenario where it will be two hundred days. Okay, okay. So what did I do? I went to the palette. I went to the agent palette, and I dragged the parameter called immunity duration is set to ninety days. Okay, to ninety. Okay. Where does this have to be used to be enacted? Anyone? Where is that used here? 
Where, 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 what thing here cares about the duration of immunity? Anyone? Turns out this thing. Remember we said 90 there? So now we're going to have to tell it. It's, it's, it's not just 90. It's going to be based on this parameter. Okay. By default, it's going to be 90. So we say main dot immunity duration. Now, if you want to be helped, you, you could press control space and it will actually uh, fill it out. It will, it will give you a choice and you can press enter. But on a Mac, it's the way will tell me what it is. It's option space, I think. Okay, so how did I do that? I said main dot, like the period dot, immune, I start typing it, control space, and it will give me the choice of things that have that word in it, IMM. And I choose immunity duration, enter, boom. There it becomes, there it goes. Okay, immunity duration. So now we've, we've set this model up so we can make different assumptions about immunity duration. By default, it'll be 90. Are we okay with this? Okay. Okay. Who needs help? TAs, uh, TAs, uh, who needs more help? Uh, help, help, fires are burning. Uh, help uh, online. Does anyone need help? Who online needs help? Yeah, 99 zero. Yeah, for the value. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna create the sob scenario with two hundred day immunity duration. Let's do that. Ready? I I'm gonna create a experiment with two hundred days. So this is going to be um, immunity duration two hundred days. So how am I gonna do this? I'm going to right click on baseline. The easiest way to do it is to copy this baseline scenario. I'm gonna right click. On, on it, and I'm gonna say copy, and I'm going to right click on the model as a whole, and I'm gonna say paste. Let me do that again. I wanna create a new scenario with an alternative assumption. I'm gonna base it on the baseline scenario, but I'm gonna set it to be a longer immunity duration. So I'm gonna copy the baseline. I'm gonna right click on it and say copy, and then I'm going to right click on the model and say paste. The model as a whole and say paste, I did. So I'm gonna call this immunity duration 100. Okay, oh sorry, 200, 200. Okay, 200. And for this one, I need to make the immunity duration, what value? 200. So ladies and gentlemen, what did I just do? Look, I said, I wanna create a new scenario. And the scenario is gonna be the baseline scenario and all its assumptions, but I wanna make an alternative immunity duration. So I right clicked baseline, I did copy. I went up to the model as a whole, I did paste. I, I created this new scenario. I called it immunity duration 200, and I changed its immunity duration to be 200. Other than that, it's the same as the baseline. Okay, who needs TA help? The TA stands stalwart, ready for deployment, vigilant. Okay. Do we need them to bring their elephants? Okay, okay. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to run immunity duration 200. Okay, there we go. Okay, so immunity duration 200 is the same as the baseline, except that 
would they have duration 200 of immunity before they become susceptible again? And I'm going to speed this up. I'm going to use this to speed it up a bit five times. And I'm going to scroll up and we're going to try to observe the spread. Okay, so it's starting down here. The earliest we expect to see every any difference now is what date? What date is it? It's about 200, yeah, 200 plus a little bit more because they have to recover, it's 200 days after they recover. So this is day 107, day 115, day 121, 124, okay, 132, 140, okay, um, 141, 150, okay, 155, okay. Okay, we're waiting a little bit longer, 170, okay. Okay, 180, yep, here we go. We're, we're getting close to where we're gonna see it. Okay, here we go. So what's happening now? People are what? They're becoming susceptible again. Do we see another wave yet? Why aren't we seeing one yet? Because there's no, there's no infectious people that have yet come into contact with it. And in fact, all the infectious people are gone by now, right? Do you see that? They're all, they're moosed. They're, they're all, what happened to the infectious people? They all what? Recovered. And guess what? It's gone back to a situation where soon enough, it will be totally what? Totally susceptible. Watch this. Yeah. So here we go. And it's coming back. And lo and behold, the population is entirely susceptible again. It's like to smallpox, right? Um, in another 100 years, no one who ever encountered smallpox will be alive. And people will be back to susceptibility with respect to it. There was no second wave because what? There were no infectious people. Okay, so that was infection duration 200. Let's go back to infectious duration 90. What happened with infectious duration 90? Sorry, sorry, immunity duration 90. Don't say infection. Immunity duration 90. What happened with that? Does anyone remember? We saw what? Multiple waves, remember that? Okay, suppose we did that one Immunity duration 90 with slow recovery. What would we see then? Immunity duration 90 with slow recovery. What would we see then? Do you think we would see multiple waves with that? If we had infectious uh, immunity duration 90, if we saw infect, uh, immunity duration 90 with, with duration of, till recovery of, of 50, do you think we would see multiple waves? Mm -hmm. Ooh, not, not virtual. I don't want to do virtual, sorry. Hey, hey come on. Okay, uh, so here we go. Down to 67. Uh, okay, so this is immunity duration 90. We're back to running it, but with slow recovery. What do you think is gonna happen? Are we gonna see multiple waves and why? What's going on? Yeah, so so is there a second wave taking place? Yeah, the first wave didn't really die down first. The first wave stuck around. Why did it stick around for so long? Because people are infectious for longer. They're infectious for 50 days. So it was still around. And now you get this mixing of, of susceptible and recovered people in sort of this wholesale way. And the infection doesn't really 
go through pronounced waves. Do you see that? It 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 kind of you know oscillates a bit, but really you have this mixing of susceptible and infectious people just on an ongoing basis, right? Um, there's not really distinct waves because the first wave hadn't really ended. Okay, finally, how do people recover? Recover in two days, but stay immune for 90 days. What do you think is going to happen then? Is there going to be a, uh, multiple waves? What will, what will it look like? Anyone? They'll recover quickly. And so what will happen? What's the implication for the waves? So they'll just affect the little posture. They'll, okay. So, so okay. So we're going to have people get, get to the recovered state sooner. And, and then those recovered individuals will lose immunity later. Will there be people around to contact them who are infected? If, if they become those people who are recovered now, they'll eventually get, so after 90 days, they'll become susceptible again. Do you think there'll be people around to contact them who are infected still? There's, uh, yep. because, yeah, because there could be still more people infections. They act well, like the last time, like 200 days is a bit well, but it's 90, but you're reducing the period of recovery. So while previously it was 10, day, uh, 10 days plus 90, now it's mm -hmm. down to 92. Yeah, you can see this kind of, it's kind of chasing it. This is the new wave. And and it's it, it seems like actually it is enough to kind of keep it going in this sort of way that, that, that you might think people recover so quickly, there's no way they'd still be around, but there's enough patches of infection in different areas that still stay burning that by the time people start losing immunity, there's some infections, infective still around, and you actually do get it sort of sticking around at a kind of low level. Um, and, and oscillating a bit, um, you could see the number of susceptibles going sort of up and down and up and down here as these kind of waves take place. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known if you, if you had asked me to bet on what would have happened. I would have demurred. I would have said, you know, I, I really can't do this in my head. It's, it's just too complicated. I probably would have guessed it would go extinct. You know, it would it would go extinct before the new wave came through, but that's the point here. The, we we can take the logical consequences of our assumption and see their implications. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the final thing I'll note here, and we're going to have a health break, is that I'm not going to dwell on it, but this model is also equipped with a final thing that you can do with these models. If you run the baseline, you'll notice that there's uh, there's this mechanism here for, for putting in place intervention. So these models are also used to ask what if questions with interventions. If we change this, this way of trying to respond and you'll notice that there's this Im ability to provide immunizations. I'll remind you, immunizations would bring people from susceptible to recovered state. And by choosing the number of people to immunize, say we're gonna say we're gonna perform immunization on about 15,000 people, okay? Um, so almost a third of the population we could say, I'm going to perform a random immunization. I'm gonna press this button. And, and basically what's going to happen is when it processes it, it's going to randomly immunize uh, people in the population. By immunize, I mean, that they're gonna turn immune at least until their immunity expires. And 
you can test out how will that affect the spread of infection. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, you could take those 15,000 people you're going to immunize. Instead of immunizing them randomly, you could immunize in an outbreak response immunization way around this area of the infection. So there we've actually immunized people around the infectious individuals. And you'll notice that has a different impact. If you immunize randomly here, it will slow it down and it's spread because there'll be fewer, fewer susceptibles around. If you perform an outbreak response immunization, you provide sort of a cordon sanitaire, right? A, a sort of periphery around these infectives where they can't penetrate easily. It's recovered people around them. And you can actually stop it here from spreading if you do a perfect job, right? If you, if you, if you have enough of them. If you don't do enough, um, if we were to, you know, uh, try to try to immunize here um, uh, with too few, maybe we only do, um, you know, something like uh, a thousand uh, individuals, um, we won't have nearly a, the effect. So I'm going to drag this up here and and I'll, I'll drag this down to about a uh, thousand here and we'll we'll start to do another uh outbreak response immunization campaign okay that's roughly a thousand let's let it spread just a little bit here and oh okay um yeah uh so it's spreading out okay and i'm going to provide this outbreak response immunization campaign by pressing that button and that will undertake this immunization. Boom. So I press that and when it processes it here, it's, it's doing a lot of work, but when it processes it, it will put a, uh, a little periphery around a thousand, about a thousand of these folks but I didn't do enough. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Actually it did. It did do enough. So a thousand were enough. And now, now folks are, are recovering and, oh no, oh no. Uh, okay. There's another wave, right? Um, and I could try to immunize around those as well. And so it goes on. So these models can be used for interventions, not just observation about what if about assumptions you know how long is it until people recover how long is it until they lose immunity but also we can simulate things like immunization or contact tracing or effects associated with faster faster uh, treatment or more effective treatment or or hygienic matters like uh, mask use etc um We'll get to that in the class, but that's one of the big uses of these models to ask what if questions. And these buttons hint at just how one does this. So what have we seen? We're gonna break now, but what have we seen big picture here? We've seen models, models as dynamic hypotheses, sort of capturing theory in ways that are visual and in ways that because they bring it out of our head and put it in the clear light of day, we can use to get critiques. We can use to collectively refine our assumptions. We can challenge our church understanding with the understanding of others and work towards a better description of the world. But we've also seen that these models are useful, not just for taking those assumptions out of our head and sharing them, but also as tools for asking about the logical consequences of those assumptions over time. And those logical consequences typically involve emergent behavior, phenomena that, that cannot be reduced to any one piece in the model, which emerge from interaction of a bunch of pieces and can be quite complex dynamically, even from a very simple model. This is a very, very simple, this is about as simple as it gets for a descriptive 
simplicity of the model, and yet it gives rise to dynamically complex behavior. Behavior that has tipping points and what are called lock in effects and path dependence, et cetera. We can also get use these models for asking what if questions as we vary our assumptions and seeing the logical consequence of those different assumptions and for simulating interventions. Um, so these tools are versatile tools in our toolbox. Uh, they're tools that we can use to not to capture the truth about the situation, but to speed us towards the truth, to help us think through the logical consequences of our assumptions more deeply, thoroughly, and reliably, and compare what the consequences are of our assumptions over time with what we actually see from the work, and thereby advance our understanding and, and place it on so more solid ground. First glimpse of a model. We're going to uh, break for 10 minutes here, and we'll reconvene and uh, talk a little bit more about the multiple types of modeling we use uh, within, within the space uh, and uh, get going with uh, some learning about uh, the types of uh, models we'll be seeing in the boot camp. Okay, so 10 minutes from now, if we could reconvene, that will be great. Thank you.